Bonjour. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, Ambassador Vimont, members of the Maison Française Advisory Board, and other distinguished guests, including students who are among, among our most distinguished. I am Shani Pierre, I'm the director of the Maison Française, and on behalf of the Maison Française, the Department of French, European Institute and Alliance Program, we're delighted to welcome the new French ambassador of the United States, Philippe Etienne, to the Maison Française. The ambassador will be introduced momentarily by Scott Barrett. Professor Scott Barrett is Vice Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs and Lenfest Earth Institute Professor of Natural Resource Economics. Um, after Ambassador Etienne's remarks, we will have a chance for a Q&A. We'll go until one o'clock, and he's expressed a particular interest in hearing questions and comments and thoughts from students, so um, we encourage you to be thinking about your questions while he's presenting some remarks. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Etienne, who will now be introduced by Vice Dean Barrett. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. I am delighted to welcome Ambassador Philippe Etienne for discussion about Europe. Ambassador Etienne is the ambassador of France to the United States. He started his diplomatic mission in Washington this summer and was until June the diplomatic advisor to President Macron. Throughout his very distinguished career as a diplomat, Ambassador Etienne has been constantly involved in European affairs. Before joining President Macron's team in 2017, he was the French ambassador to Germany. Before that, he served for five years as the permanent representative of France to the European Union. In Paris, Ambassador Etienne held prestigious positions at the Quai d'Orsay, including being the chief of staff of Foreign Minister Bernard Kouchner. He also served as the French ambassador to Romania and was posted to Belgrade, Bonn, and Moscow. Ambassador, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to Columbia. Columbia University has fostered a special relationship with France and the French-speaking world. The Maison Française has been the home for all things French at Columbia. One reason why I love coming here so much. Um, for more than a century, and works with the French department, the Institute of African Studies, SIPA, my school, the European Institute, the Alliance Program, and other departments and schools on campus. Symmetrically are Columbia Global Centers, Paris Reed Hall. If you haven't been, you must go. It's quite delightful. It sits at the heart of the French capital. I'm delighted to add that SIPA and the European Institute are hosting as visiting professor, Ambassador Pierre Vimont, uh, who is with us today and also served as French ambassador to the United States. Two years ago at the Sorbonne, French, uh, French President Macron called for a new initiative for Europe and for the rebuilding of a sovereign, united, and democratic Europe. I have to say, as a personal note, I'm a joint dual US-UK citizen, so the subject of Europe is a rather difficult one for me. Um, and we're very much looking forward to hearing Ambassador Etienne's thoughts about present and future challenges for Europe, including that one. Please join me in welcoming Pre uh, French Ambassador Philippe Etienne. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, uh, dear friends. Um, it's uh, it's a real pleasure for me to, to 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 be here today. It's a great honor also to be in this prestigious university, but also a great pleasure because I know that uh, with La Maison Française and uh, with me, with the Alliance Program, this university has a, a special uh, link with France and. Uh, a special friendship and uh, we appreciate this enormously and I, I, I am very thankful to you uh, to have uh, uh, made this uh, meeting with you professors and uh, students possible. So I, I actually I would like mostly uh, uh, have this dialogue with you on Europe but I will try I will do my best to, to introduce it. Uh, I'm sure you don't need uh, ideas to ask questions, but uh, I will try to set uh, the scene. Um, starting from what Scott said, actually, why do we need a, a, a new start from Europe, for Europe? Of course, the European Union is something 
which is uh, quite unique in the history, which has been built starting from the Second World War and built on the lessons we, we had to, to, to learn from two world wars in Europe. Um, but the European Union is something which has been changing all the time and which has gone through uh, crises and uh, rebirths. But most important, the world is completely different today from what it was not only after World War II, but also uh, in the 90s or during the great enlargement of the European Union to the new democracies uh, of Central and Eastern Europe uh, in 2004. Uh, we have new challenges. Some of them are inside the EU. One of them is called indeed Brexit, uh, which is a, not only a challenge, it's also uh, an issue, a, a negative issue we have to, to sort out together with our British friends. But many of these challenges are outside the EU or common to the EU and to the world. So our president, when he he was elected. He was elected. Emmanuel Macron was elected on, on, on a European program. He had decided to campaign, contrary to the mainstream parties, uh, speaking about Europe. The mainstream parties thought the European idea was uh, uh, unpopular in France since uh, we we had this failed referendum in 2005. He decided it, it was an issue which should not be left to the anti-European parties. And he was right. He has uh, his success lies also uh, in the fact that he addressed the real issues, which the people wanted to, to listen, uh, uh, being discussed in a in a democracy. And he also presented his views not only before being elected, but then after being elected in this speech he made on September 26, 2017 in the University La Sorbonne, because obviously he thought the, the best place to do that was in the a university, because it was about the future, about uh, what the, the new generation should have to be to build in Europe. And you, you mentioned the three basic words he used, united, democratic, and sovereign, and I would like to to, to, de to, to dwell on the third uh, concept, which is uh, the concept of sovereign Europe, to, to, to try to explain to you what, uh, what we, we mean with this idea. Actually, from the very outset of the European uh, integration history, uh, it was about pulling sovereign national sovereignties together uh, in the most important issues of that time, uh, again, it was to prevent war on Europe, on the European continent, so to pool resources and decision-making in, in the most important issues for that purpose. So the idea to be sovereign together as a more united, more integrated Europe is not new as a method, but as I said, the challenges now are new and they are bigger maybe than they have ever been. So the idea of sovereignty is not something which, is, which means that we, we have no more sovereign nations, but that we uh, uh, defend, develop, work at this uh, sovereignty uh, in, on the global scene together. And the main issues which are there to be considered and which were developed in this speech or in further uh, um, uh, proposals, which our president uh, presented, for instance, uh, some months ago during the campaign for the European elections, for the elections to the new European Parliament, which has been elected last May, um, are uh, um, uh, more specific to uh, a certain number of policy areas. The general idea being that Europe must be more, the European Union must be more integrated, more efficient, more quick also in its decision process, where it makes a difference for, for, bigger, for bigger issues, for global issues, which doesn't mean that it must be more integrated in all other issues, maybe on the contrary, in some other issues, 
um, we must give more leeway, more uh, space, more room for uh, for a nation, not only for national, for nations, but also for local governments. We must more empower the society in general. But there are big issues where our future depends very much on a, on a more integrated approach by the European uh, nations. Um, the first issue, of course, is not of course, the first issue, I, I will not uh, bring them to the discussion in, uh, in, in any uh, order. Uh, they are all uh, uh, important, they are all related between them, but the first issue is uh, um, uh, about economy. We have a, a, a common currency, this common currency, the euro, and the Eurozone, the, 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 the Economic and Monetary Union, went through big difficulties after the financial crisis in 2008, and we had to reform it. It has not been completely reformed. It is not um, uh, fit for, completely fit for a future possible uh, crisis. But it's also about uh, our trade policy. Um, there is a word which is important in, in the, in the um, uh, trade policy today, which is the word of reciprocity. What does it mean? What does it mean fair, fair trade in, in relation to free trade? European, the European Union stands for a, a free trade, but we think also we must have uh, in our competition policy or in our trade policy, we must have the instruments to uh, have a, a fair level playing field. So this is the first block of issues which have to be uh, to be to be tackled. There is a, a second field which is migration and asylum. It's a, it's a shame uh, uh, that we, we we were not able uh, as a European Union to face uh, the migration crisis, which. Uh, uh, occurred this after the eurozone the, the crisis of uh, the financial crisis it was the second big crisis we faced uh, in the last years it was a migration crisis in 2015 so it's a it's a, it's a fact that we we could not face this uh, big crisis together we we have uh, legislative uh, we have a regulation a regulatory framework for uh, as migration and uh, uh, asylum policies, especially for asylum policies, but it is not strong enough. And we we see, especially in the, in the um, um, humanitarian uh, tragedies which uh, played out in the Mediterranean Sea, w that we, we we have not a policy which is strong enough, clear enough, to uh, face uh, those issues. Other otherwise than uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Like it is not acceptable that uh, for every, every event uh, we, we have to take a, a, a decision. So the idea here is really to have a more integrated policy for asylum seekers and um, to um, have a more integrated policy for the common border which we have around what we call the Schengen area, which is, which is the area of free circulation among our countries. The third issue is um, the energy and climate transition. This is a huge challenge. Our societies, will not, our nations, will not face this big transition to, uh, other than together for obvious reasons. Um, you have uh, the European Union has been uh, has had a, a, a real leadership in climate negotiations, and still has it, and we have uh, quite a good performance in in the evolution of uh, emissions. But frankly, we do not do enough. But and we must be efficient worldwide because it's a, a global challenge. So if you have not the instruments uh, uh, to regulate. Uh, for instance, carbon pricing or carbon leakages, uh, you will not be successful in uh, having an efficient um, 
climate and energy transition. Of course, we have very different policies across the countries of Europe as far as our energy mixes are concerned, for instance, nuclear energy. But it doesn't prevent us from having this more efficient, more uh, stronger, and more integrated policy for this energy and climate transition. The third, the, 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 the fourth uh, uh, policy field I will mention is um, the digital and um, AI, artificial intelligence revolution. Here, the European Union has been a front runner with uh, the uh, adoption of a general regulation on the protection of personal data, which is uh, being discussed quite a lot here, for instance, in the United States. But uh, we are not the front runners in innovation, obviously, the US, but also China. Uh, now are the leaders, and we must be much more ambitious, much more and am also efficient to create uh, value in our societies. We have the innovation capacities. We have also our model pri on privacy, uh, the fight against uh, um, dangerous contents on the internet was also a field where Europe has taken the initiatives. But we have not yet succeeded in, uh, in getting the, 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 the most efficient way to develop our own uh, science, our own uh, technological capacities, which we do have, into um, uh, what we call unicorns or bigger businesses for different reasons. I can uh, uh, um, turn to if you, if, you, if you want to discuss this issue. And of course, the last... Uh, but not least, uh, field is uh, a defense and foreign policy. Here, we, um, we have uh, had treaties of the European Union, which have started already quite a long time ago to start to, to, to speak about a, a, cur a common uh, a foreign policy. We have with Ambassador Vimont somebody who has developed it in the He's uh, one of his previous jobs in Brussels. Um, we have even treaties speaking about um, what should be step by step, what should become a, a European defense um, and policy. But obviously, we have very, very, very uh, little to show in this last uh, uh, domain. We have made, uh, as EU, uh, uh, we have made progress. We have created uh, military or civil operations abroad. For instance, in, uh, in, uh, in Macedonia at the beginning of the 2000s, Europe was there with a mission which played a very positive role. But globally, we are not very far, very, very much advanced. One of the issues is the issue of the um, um, capacities of the uh, the money we invest in it. There is a real issue of burden sharing with the United States. The U.S. is right to, to say that. But it is also very much an issue of uh, common strategical uh, visions of what we should do. We have the United Kingdom and France who have tra tra traditions of uh, e including of uh, projections of their armies uh, outside Europe. We have other big nations, which for historical reasons, such as Germany, have been much more cautious. And uh, we can understand that. I was ambassador in Germany. I, can, I, 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 I have much respect for this, uh, these historical reasons, of course. We have nations which uh, have very much suffered uh, from uh, the Soviet domination, which are now members of our un Union, who have their own uh, concerns about their own security, which we also respect and must respect and must take on board. The general idea would be to have, and it can it will not happen overnight, uh, to, to make these uh, uh, strategic no. visions converge. Not only at the level of uh, political uh, foreign policy, but also at the level of defense policy, formulating defense policies, formulating security strategies. Form we have common security strategy at the level of the EU, but 
to to go further and to to prepare together for uh, uh, what should be our reaction if new and we know that it will happen new crisis uh, especially on on our neighborhood in in our neighborhood at our borders uh, develop we have for instance now Syria uh, but we have also Sahel uh, where our country France the French army is very much engaged to fight against terrorism. We will have other threats and other um, um, crises in the future. So we, this is uh, one field where we, in the, in the follow-up of the Sorbonne speech, took uh, some initiatives. We have developed the instrument which existed in our treaty of a um, so-called PESCO, uh, which is a structured cooperation between our defense policies. But we have also, on the French side, launched an intervention initiative to, to bring closer together among some of the European nations this uh, cultural uh, vision and cul strategic cultures. This is, in our vision, absolutely not uh, contradictory to, to NATO. It's uh, complementary. We think that the US especially will stay uh, on board of the European security all the more if the Europe itself is, cap is capable, is able to deliver. The critics we have, and you, you could, you can have, probably you have heard about a recent interview by the French president to the Economist, is about the current state of uh, political, not military, but political and strategic consultation and cooperation inside NATO, as shown by the develop recent developments in the Syrian crisis. But of course, um, considering that NATO on, on the one side uh, is absolutely uh, essential to the European nations for their security, but considering that it doesn't work that well, uh, now what we should try to build up is uh, more capacity and more uh, will on the European side to develop our own European defense policy and instrument and on the other side of course to have NATO working better and really having a new it will be maybe the what will be done at the next uh, NATO summit in London having a, a, a real conversation on what means today collective security uh, because all, all organization must be also reviewed and adapted to the to the challenges we have so these are so the, the most important policy fields where the idea, the notion of uh, European sovereignty now tends to be really uh, a priority. And I was happy to introduce uh, our exchange with uh, those uh, uh, more concrete examples because probably you would have uh, uh, questions on some of those uh, different uh, policy fields. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, please. Thank you very much for those remarks. And um, as I said in my introduction, um, Ambassador Etienne really wanted to this, this to be a discussion with students. Um, and so be thinking of your questions. I'll just maybe ask a first question to get things rolling. Um, you're coming into this role as ambassador with a president, an American president and administration that hasn't been the friendliest to Europe and perhaps not the most appreciative of a historic alliance. Um, I'm, this is being recorded, so I know there's maybe a limit to what you can say, but what does it feel like to be the ambassador to this particular administration? Well, you, you, you know, uh, we, we are, uh, as like all my predecessors, uh, my, my job is uh, about uh, our relations uh, with, the, with the United States uh, as the United States is. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <laughs> We had uh, many, I, I was, um, as, I, as I said, or as uh, Scott said, I was, uh, before coming here, I was uh, the uh, NSA in France. I was a diplomatic advisor, President Emmanuel Macron. So I, when I came here, I had already the experience of many interactions with uh, the American president and with uh, the administ this administration. And uh, of course, it is uh, different from uh, 
uh, the times are, are not the same. The world is also changing, not only the US. So we have to adapt ourselves. And um, since, uh, as you said, it is recorded, <laughs> I may stop here. But uh, um, it's uh, it's uh, well, it's really um, important to to work together. Mm -hmm. And we uh, we had uh, a, a, a many interactions between our president. Uh, uh, President Trump visited uh, France quite uh, often since uh, there were also different opportunities to do that. Um, the last one being the G7 summit where uh, the, the, there was a, the interaction between the two presidents was very, very important on, uh, on Iran, on trade, for instance, on all G7 topics. We can discuss them. But our president made also a state visit to the United States, uh, which was, I think, also very successful, both the meeting with President Trump and the speech he made to the Congress. So things are happening and uh, also uh, re real cooperations, real cooperations, uh, especially uh, on the military field, in the fight against terrorism, in Sahel, in Syria, we see we had some uh, um, uh, ups and downs, but uh, uh, we, we, we fight together also in Levant against terrorism. Iran is, uh, was also, well, it is not so consensual. We have our differences on, the, on what uh, we should do uh, there, but we, 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 we work very much together. We talk very much with the American administration. Climate, of course, is a, so it's, we disagree on the Paris Agreement. I'm sure we, it's a good example where we can work also with uh, other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. The US, the implementation of the uh, Paris commitments in, against climate change actually depend very much on all in Europe, like in the US, everywhere in the world, on many, many, many people. So uh, even on climate, we, we can work very much with uh, all sorts of people, with the administration, in some fields, but also with the states, with the cities, with the business community. Mm -hmm. so plenty of things to do mm -hmm. in this context. Plenty of positive things. Right. To do. Um, all right, we have two microphones. So I have a first question here. I'm sorry, in the second row, Lisa. Thanks. Um, I am Ruben. I'm a student here at the European Institute, um, master student. And my question is regarding you. You were brought to the as a special advisor to Macron, in part because of your profound knowledge of Germany, because you're, as you said, ambassador to Germany, right? Um, and obviously, one of the main pillars of of this global speech and you know, all of this uh, strategic sovereignty is about um, is it. One of the things that's very important to, to reaching that is what has been now um, German cooperation, right? Um, whether it be the European Defense Initiative, whether it is the, the Eurozone budget, you know, the Eurozone more stable, and you know, the increase in the national role of the Euro. So in, in your role, what was what was your experience like? What did you, you know, counsel and that form to get the Germans on board? And it seems to me like up until now it hasn't really um, progressed that much. Obviously, you've seen some divisions recently. Um, about the future of Europe, and where do you think that comes from? I've served uh, two times in Germany in the 80s and as ambassador more recently, and uh, I am convinced personally that indeed nothing great can be achieved uh, in the European integration process without uh, uh, a deep compromise, uh, compromise effort. Uh, and uh, common uh, understandings between uh, Germany and France, uh, not only because um, Germany and France are important countries in the European Union, but also because they are very different. And very, very often, on the most important issues, they, take, they start from different positions. So a compromise between the different positions is essential. I must immediately say that any uh, compromise or any common proposal by Germany and France is not uh, acceptable by the others. It has also, if it has not involved early enough the other nations. So it's a balance between having a, um, a great and a, a good and an efficient cooperation between the two countries, but also 
and balance between that and involving all the other nations, which is very important. Um, and to answer directly your question, yes, we have uh, made progress. Uh, um, it's it's always like that, you know. The, you can always, we say in French, you can see the the, the glass uh, half empty or half full. Uh, we have um, uh, negotiated a new bilateral treaty, so-called Aix La Chapelle uh, Treaty, Art Treaty, uh, on the top of the Elysee Treaty. I can we can go into the details if you want. We have uh, uh, adopted new, uh, very important military equipment programs. Uh, we have ex adopted the idea of a, for the first time of a Eurozone budget. Um, we have uh, developed uh, our common um, views on uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. All those fields, I quote, and I could mention many others, were domains where on the, at the beginning uh, either we do, did not agree at all between Germany and France or uh, we, we had very ambitious goals for those capacity military equipment programs. So yes, things are moving forward between Germany and France. Things are not easy, uh, but it has always been that way. And it depends on the elections in uh, the two countries. It depends on many, many issues. We are democracies, we are nations, but we, we, we want to have to build an integrated European Union. This is always um, not a paradox, but uh, you, you, you have to, to, to take into account also the internal cycles, economic and political cycles. This is where we are. So yes, we have made progress between Germany and France in the two last years. Yes, we must go um, further to reach the goals which we, um, uh, which I mentioned, but again, if you took the, if you take the example of the migration and asy asylum policies, it's obvious that we have common interests, considering what Germany had to uh, leave in 2015. So we work very hard also on these asylum issues, on foreign and security issues, and we, I am convinced, we will make uh, more progress. Thank you. Yes, it's a question in the front. So, a uh, question regarding the uh, challenges of France uh, nowadays as uh, the dominant country in the world uh, when it comes to the issues of multilateralism. And within the context of the relations uh, with the United States, and uh, given the fact that nationalism is also a current that has been uh, uh, coming, back, coming back to the France, uh, in the US, in the UK, for example. So how is France looking at the, let's say, the UN policy of multilateralism within the same uh, framework of uh, the relations with the United States? Well, thank you uh, for the question, because I, I should have said that uh, in France, we see, obviously, and it's, it's uh, something evident, of course, uh, uh, um, a real uh, connection and interrelation between three levels reforms national reforms european progress and international uh, action and europe is also a continent or the more precisely the european union stands for a multilateral uh, treatment of global challenges Europe, the European Union is strong at that because it's our policy, it's our experience, it's our conviction, it's also our nature. The European Union was built on a uh, cooperation between different nations. So the European Union as such is a sort of, a, not a model, but an of example of what we can achieve with uh, a cooperation. Um, maybe cooperation uh, between countries is more clear than multilateralism, which for uh, uh, citizens may be... Uh, but you're right, the, 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 the real concept is multilateralism. But now I have something to add, which is very important to understand our position and where we are. Um, we are not, uh, and it was also uh, clear in the speech of President Macron when, he when he, 
he, he stood before the members of the House of Representatives and of the Senate in the Congress during his state visit. We are not to keep the multilateral system as it is now. We are uh, open, uh, more than open, we are for uh, adapting it. And it's not only for NATO, it's uh, the WTO, for instance. Uh, uh, our president was, I think, the first one in a speech in OECD in spring last year to make a clear to, to take a clear commitment to the reform of the WTO. So, and um, we, 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 we think that this multilateral order must be uh, kept, but also re kept in, in its principle, the principle of cooperation, only cooperation among nations more than ever can address the global challenges we have. It is our not for us, it's absolutely evident and uh, essential. But we have to, to adapt to, to this order, these institutions, uh, this framework, to uh, the, the world where we live today. And it is not only a question of organization, it is also a question of con how we conceive the international negotiations. Just take the example of internet, just take the example of climate. There are not anymore only the states which take part to this multilateral framework. There are other stakeholders, the civil society, the, the economy, uh, science. Science was crucial to get to the Paris Agreement. Uh, so um, this is adapting the multilateral order and uh, our international um, life and cooperation is also a matter of how we, and with whom we want to negotiate. This is the vision, and I think that uh, at one point we, we should, uh, and it was a message also in the speech to the Congress, we, we must uh, find a common interest with the United States to, to doing that, because this international order has been created by us, and especially by the US after World War II. And uh, we agree with some, even in, with this administration on, on some of the problems which are, for instance, in the WTO, the level playing field, absence of a level playing field. So we should find, and it is essential to find a, a consensus, a transatlantic consensus on uh, how to deal with this. There's a question in the back here. This woman in the third row. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. You spoke earlier about how one concern for France is making stronger and more integrated policies for immigration. So I was wondering kind of like if you could expand on more what those would, would look like and also how they would reconcile with the real humanitarian concerns posed by immigration and different um, crises throughout the world. So your question is how we reconcile humanitarian concerns, concerns with also making stronger and active more integrated policies for, um, for accepting immigration and for um, working on different um, issues that people face. Because indeed we have this humanitarian uh, tradition. By the way, France is uh, again, I think these days, a country with the, the, the highest number of asylum. Uh, requests uh, in the EU, so it's a reality anyway. And we have, we want to keep uh, to the our principles, our constitutions, our international conventions. And on the other end, we have this uh, uh, asylum um, uh, policy, which is uh, um, something we have to look at how it works in the reality because we have as we say mixed migration flows i don't know whether you you understand what i mean with mixed but with asylum seekers and uh, other other categories of migrants we, which we have also to uh, to treat in a fair way so um, the issue is to have a more efficient asylum policy in the eu more harmonized uh, because although we have an, a framework, a legal framework in the EU for asylum, 
there are still big differences between uh, the um, a, um, different uh, tech. I, I don't want to to be too technical, but different uh, um, parts of our national asylum legislations, and we have also to consider how to to uh, with the as I said with the fact that we have a common outer border, how we must uh, handle the migratory flows which go through these borders or which come at these borders. So it's, uh, it's really difficult because for, I, I will give you one example. The current state of our legislation, which is called the Dublin Regulation, says that the country in the EU responsible for the uh, uh, hand, for handling one asylum request is the first entry country. And the country which are the bo southern border of the EU say it is unfair. And the result of this is there are a lot of what we call secondary movements from people who are, whose asylum request has been turned down and we try the, the chance more to the north. And then the northern country says it is unfair, so it doesn't work properly. And we 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 try to, to, to make us a stronger framework, which um, more efficient. I don't know at all whether I answered your question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So I'm Mr. Master, thank you for coming all the way here. Uh, so my name is Paul, and I'm a student here at Columbia. Um, I was also a student at Sciences Po, like a few of my comrades here. Uh, so um, I had a question about um, Erdogan's recent um, intrusion in Syria. Um, you know, as as President Trump uh, moved out of um, you know the Syrian geopolitical context, um, I was wondering what you thought about Europe's response to this, um, and also the fact that um, you know Erdogan has threatened Europe to release barriers for migrants to Europe if we took action. Do you think um, Europe's response to this threat and to Trump's exit of Syria? Um, alors d'abord bonjour à, aux élèves de Sciences Po qui sont ici. Vous êtes, vous êtes combien de France qui, Vous pouvez lever les. D'accord, ben ça, ça me fait très plaisir de, de vous voir tous et de ce que un ambassadeur de français a aussi la charge entre guillemets des communautés françaises qui sont dans son pays. Donc ça me fait très plaisir de vous rencontrer. So, to, to come back to your, to your question, um, um, we have condemned as Europe, not only as France, the Turkish incursion into Syria for different reasons. And uh, uh, one of them was, and the most important probably, it was uh, endangering our common fight against uh, ISIS and the terrorist organization which have uh, uh, hit uh, our, our nations, not only France, but uh, in particular France. Um, so, uh, uh, I think that the political um, reaction by Europe was, we were quite well aligned one among European nations politically. And we have seen that again um, last Thursday in Washington, when we had this uh, meeting of the international ministerial meeting of the international coalition against uh, ISIS, which was uh, which we, with the American leadership, the, this meeting was a proposal by the French foreign minister, but uh, we wanted it, well we had proposed it to be in Washington because uh, the the it was about reaffirming clearly after the decisions announced by President Trump some weeks before and the Turkish initiative to reaffirm this uh, this coalition and its goals and it has been done and the European countries were united on this and all on all aspects of course when it comes to what we can do what capacities we have then we have the issue of uh, the European Union not being uh, uh, yet uh, able, uh, if the U.S. at one point doesn't want to be involved, uh, and if our security is primarily in Europe uh, really um, endangered, then have we the instruments 
uh, in military terms, in security terms, all together to, to come together and to intervene. For the time being, we have some nations in Europe which can give some contributions. Um, in Syria, in Iraq, we do that. But uh, we, uh, we can, it's difficult to imagine that the, only, the Europeans alone could do that. So in practical terms, we need to learn from this. And we, we, it's one of the good examples where we can see that we must really, um, as I said in my introduction, uh, in the future, get more um, uh, capacities to act together especially when the U.S., which is, frankly, it's uh, the U.S. in the future, I don't take this example uh, as such, but in the future, you can have situations when uh, even with a, a flourishing NATO, you, you have the U.S. deciding not to intervene, and then it's up to the European nations to, to do what they have to do in, in coordination with the U.S. And we are not yet there where the, U the EU would have really the, the, the capacity. So politically, the answer is yes. We have reacted united and uh, on the lines which uh, we in France consider really important. Militarily, of course, we are not uh, yet there. But you knew that. You have a question? OK, I'm going to let Scott ask a question. And then, and then you'll be next. And, and uh, maybe also to remind all of us, but it was also, more, I think, in your question, that after the Turkish incursion, which we have condemned, and the decision by the US to withdraw, uh, we have come, thanks also to this meeting last Thursday, to uh, we, 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 we got somewhat closer to the US again in terms of what we wanted to do, especially to fight against terrorism, which is positive, of course. Uh, thank you very much again for coming to Colombia for this interesting event. I want to come to this issue raised before about international cooperation. So Europe has its own difficulties now, as always, but now especially. Uh, the world has great difficulties. The leadership that we often counted on um, has not only not been there, but has been um, if anything, destructive to international cooperation in a number of areas. Uh, so one approach is, as you said before, to stand up for consensus and to try to um, address legitimate concerns about um, weaknesses in the institutions we have and to um, uh, remind everyone how important it is for countries to cooperate. But there are times when it can be pretty frustrating when partners are not playing their role, and France has spoken up a bit uh, about two issues I'll mention. Uh, one, in the international context, uh, just over a year ago, President Macron was speaking to the General Assembly of the United Nations, and said, and this is after Trump had uh, announced that he would withdraw from the uh, Paris Agreement, said that uh, we should no longer do trade deals with countries mm -hmm. that don't participate in the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. and in the global effort to address climate change. Uh, so that's one. And the other one was recently when uh, Britain uh, uh, applied for an extension again for uh, Brexit. And France hesitated a bit before uh, agreeing. And there's at least a suggestion that the next time around uh, that uh, request may not be satisfied. So here are two places where France seems to at least be tempted to um, be a little harder uh, on its allies. Well, there are two very important topics, but for me quite different uh, issues. On the first one, uh, I made an allusion to it. It's abs look if the EU as such or take any, any other country or group of countries who, who takes very, very ambitious commitments to reduce uh, greenhouse gases emissions, which takes, for, to, to get to this, to, to, to implement that goal, uh, which takes very hard regulations. Um, and then what, does, what will happen, for instance? There will be some industries which would say, 
instead of uh, transforming their pro industrial processes, instead of innovating, well, let's go to other places where they have not the same um, regulations in place. So what is the result? First, you lose jobs, you lose growth, and you have an unfair competition. And second, the result in terms of emissions is not better. It could get even worse because I mentioned this issue of uh, carbon leakages. It is the, the, the same issue. You, you will have the same or even worse uh, environmental results, uh, but in other, other places. So it's for, for these two very important essential reasons, it's, it's really logical to, to make a link between uh, uh, economic cooperation in general and climate policies. It's a, it's a reality. Uh, we have to, to face this. Um, the, 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 the only positive answer is a global answer, of course. The only positive and global answer is international cooperation, implementation of the Paris Agreement, uh, which the Paris Agreement says explicitly that every country will have to increase its commitments, its so-called INDC, uh, every five years. So this is the answer. On the second issue, uh, on the delay for uh, Brexit to happen, uh, it has been prolonged already uh, a number of sometimes. The last time, because of uh, new elections taking place in the UK on December 12th, we have all agreed very easily to, although. It was not uh, very uh, satisfactory, but what can we do since there are elections? The last but one time, there was indeed a debate between the heads of state and government, and the compromise they found, and uh, the France uh, intervened in the way you, 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 and I will come back to the reasons of that, but the result was uh, end of October this year. Why? Because. On November 1st, we should have had the new institutions. Finally, the new commission will probably start uh, on December 1st. It's um, more or less what is uh, underway now. Uh, but it was a normal compromise and a good idea to have Brexit happening when the new commission uh, starts for all sorts of reasons, legal, budgetary, financial. Why? 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 Why do we have this uh, and, uh, attitude? First, again, I said it, Brexit is essentially negative. It's a situation where everybody will lose something. We, we regret this decision, but this, this, this decision was taken, and it, it was taken by, by the British people in a referendum. Uh, we have always said on the French side, we were ready to give more, to, to decide to give more time to the process if there were something happening. If, for instance, some, some decision was taken, like this time, to have new elections, to, to, in it, to allow for a decision to be taken by the British Parliament, or a new referendum, or, uh, I don't know, the British government taking back its uh, Article 50 uh, application. So the Brexit, uh, this. but to give time only to prolong the, the situation of disorder, of uncertainties, was not good for anybody. This was the reason. And uh, I think it was uh, clear for everybody. On the other hand, I understand also that you have people saying, well, let's try, let's try, let's give time to see what happens. But we, we, we must see also that uh, and you are you have the dual citizenship you said so you are a british citizen also you you have seen what what has been happening in westminster since it's no decision only uh, i don't know whether it is good for uh, even in i am not here to to say what is good for other countries even for my country i, would, I should be shy but so for 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 the uk i think it is obviously not a good thing that things are happening this way so it was uh, it was the background of all of this. We have surely not uh, taken this position 
for um, um, the, the sake of other countries, the UK or others, we have taken this decision for as our own position, but we thought of the interest of the EU as such. Because, as I said, and it is uh, the content of our exchange, we have many things to decide in the EU. And the sooner the things, things are clarified on the Brexit, the sooner we can first, which is very, very often forgotten, we can first turn to negotiating the future relation between the UK and Europe, which is very important. And we cannot do that as long as we, don't, we didn't agree on the withdrawal agreement. And second, we can turn to the EU regional business and all those challenges. This, is, this was the reason. I think it is a, understandable, but I understand also why you asked. So I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there, but I want to thank you um, so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and talk with us and invite you to come back whenever you'd like. Thank, thank you very so much. much.